Great. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's nice to be here, uh, especially because so five years ago this week, my, my dad died, and uh, he was a, a Christian brother for 22 years, so it's, a, I guess, a miracle that I'm here, but he'd be tickled to <laughs> know about this event. Um, so I'm a faculty member here at the School of Social Work, and, uh, and Dean Flynn, who couldn't be here today, um, always suggests that we start our presentations with a joke. And uh, so last night I was looking up jokes about, you know, priests and rabbis and ministers walking into a bar. And I just felt like that probably isn't appropriate for today. So I'm just going to forgo the joke. I'm glad that uh, my dean's not here. And, and get into my remarks really about, um, about Housing First. And, and I think some of you may know what Housing First is. Uh, if you don't, don't worry. That's what I'm going to talk about. And if you do, um, I hope that maybe by the end of today's conversation, you'll think about it a little differently. Um, I just wanted to get a quick show of hands here. How many people think that homelessness has gotten worse in the U.S. over the past 10 years? Quick show of hands. Okay. So I, it's always good. I think like learning from your mistakes, you kind of like realize, you know, you, that's where you learn stuff. So, so it's great because actually homelessness in the country is getting better, right? Uh, this is a, this is, we do this homeless count every year. We do it in LA. And if you look at the point in time count over, you know, uh, over the past 10 years, you see actually a pretty good, right? A, pr a pretty good slope downward. And, and so that's good. So why do we all think it's gotten worse? Part, part of the reason, because actually it has here, right? It has in LA, it's gotten, it's gotten much worse. And if you take a look at the map, this is nationally, uh, you'll see that the, the, the light gray are places where it's gotten worse. But in other places, you'll see it's actually improved. And, you know, a lot of that, we don't really have time to get into all of it, but a lot of that has to do with, right, housing affordability. If you look in some of the Midwestern states and in the South where, where housing is more affordable, you can actually see some progress in this space. So I, I, I think that says something. Now, uh, in LA, right, I mentioned the homeless count. We've partnered with uh, the county last year to do it, and, and, um, and we're, do we're also helping them out this year. And, and I think most people have heard the punchline about how, how there's been a 23% increase and we're up to almost 58,000 uh, people experience homelessness on any given night, and I think you heard that before. I think the, the, um, the stat that gets a little less attention, but I think should probably also be on the front page of a, of a newspaper, but I haven't seen it, is that last year the county actually housed, provided housing to over 14,000 people. So these were 14,000 people who had been homeless for a long time, considered chronically homeless, um, and they were able to get them in off the streets into an apartment of their own um, and to provide them supports. So that's a, that's a pretty uh, impressive number. And as you can see, the county's gotten better at it each year we've increased the capacity and and you know with with uh, the support of different measures we expect that to continue so how did we do that uh, in part we did that through what i'm going to talk about today which is housing first an approach to service delivery so okay so why why am i talking about housing first well in part you heard i, I ran a housing first agency i do research on it um but also because Shameless plug for my book. I wrote a book on it. So with my co-authors, uh, Deborah Paget and uh, Samson Barris. And so hopefully it's available in the bookstore, but if not, you can go on Amazon. And so I just want to talk about, you know, what we try to lay out in the book. And we open, we open the book with a set of questions. Um, and the question is about kind of social policy, and it, and it asks like some rhetorical questions about how often, you know, successful evidence-based interventions um, are rooted uh, in fundamentally in human rights? How often do you see social policy change attributed to actual research findings? Um, how often do effective social programs get the endorsement of the left and the right um, political leaning leaders? And how often do you see social policies develop in the US and then adopted in other socially progressive countries like Canada, Australia, and Europe? So, as much as we like to think this happens all the time, this is a pretty rare occasion, and Housing First is one of, one of those rare occasions. And so it's definitely, it's definitely worth taking, um, uh, thinking about that as a model for how we address other, other issues. Um, but what I, I think to understand Housing First, you really need to understand what it was in response to, right? And so in the early 80s, when sort of the modern day homelessness first became an issue, we developed a response to it. And it wasn't necessarily a well-thought-out response, but it's something that in hindsight, we, there's a logic to it. And I wanted to kind of share that with you real quick. 
And that's basically what we call the staircase approach or the treatment first approach now in, in, in contrast to the housing first approach. But basically, you know, the idea was as people were, we'd, we would see them on the streets, we'd do outreach, we got outreach teams together, and then we'd offer them things like shelter or maybe you need to go to hospital or you want to go to drug treatment. And, um, and if people were, you know, accepting of that, then they might go into a, a kind of a housing program where they could learn to live independently. And then eventually we would help them sort of get back on their feet and into independent housing. And there was a logic to this, right? I mean, I think it's intuitive in some ways, but there was a logic that basically said, look, we'll help you in this system as long as, you know, you can demonstrate to us a few things, you know, kind of that you're worthy of, of these services and housing. Um, you know, people would have to listen to the advice of social workers like myself um, and, and agree with what I'm saying. They'd have to get some clean and sober time. They'd have to become psychiatric stable. So again, I think, I think you can see the, uh, where this comes from, and a lot of it was sort of helping people become housing ready is what, what they often talked about. The problem with this approach is that homelessness is getting better, it got worse, in part because, you know, people either really didn't want to like listen to uh, what others had to say, they wanted to live their own lives the way they wanted, um, in part because you're asking people who have chronic conditions to fix those conditions before you're really going to help them get what they want. And so what we, what we have is this legacy of an institutional circuit where people would just enter shelters, get into programs, drop out, get kicked out, whatever it was, end up back on the streets and jails, other places, and so things got worse. I think with that background, you can then understand housing first a little bit better. Um, because basically it was the idea of, so why do we have to do that? Couldn't we help people sort of move in and get in off the streets, kind of stabilize in an apartment, in a home, and then provide them supports? So why do we have to make supports contingent on them proving something to us, right? Why can't we just support them in their lives and their goals? And, you know, ultimately I think that these these are, these are different models. One sounds a lot like it's about housing, the other is about treatment. Um, but I think a lot of the difference really is that, you know, housing, housing first came from sort of a person-centered approach uh, where it's not me as an expert, as a clinician telling you what to do, but it's me there to walk beside you and to help you figure out how to advance the kind of goals that you want. And so I think that's a, that's a really uh, important distinction. I could talk a, a bit about sort of the research um, around this, but it seems like for today, I kind of want to get to um, get to a conversation more than anything else. But needless to say, that uh, research over you know the past decade has proven over and over again that this is a pretty effective model, getting people in off the streets. Um, it saves money, and you, you can see all around here they talk about permanent supportive housing and why we should be doing it. So I don't really have to belabor that point. Um, and actually, I'm going to I'm going to skip through. The, um, well, now let, let me just let me just make one other point. I think. Look, the systems that are in place um, have a lot to do with how we as clinicians or people treat the, the clients who are being served by that, right? And, and some of the research we found that was when Housing First was done right, it really freed people up to allow them to really work on actually the things they wanted to. And in the Treatment First approach, what we found was actually that all that all that providers could focus on is getting people's housing applications together. It actually dissuaded them from addressing some of the issues, right? Because you can imagine if you're, if you're a case manager and you know that the only way they're going to get in housing is if they're clean and sober and you suspect maybe they relapse, you might not bring that up to them, right? You're actually doing a disservice. And, and I even had one, one provider talk about it as really, look, our job is to package people up so that housing providers will accept them, and it's like moving people through a conveyor belt, right? It's actually kind of a, a, a commodification of an individual, which is exactly not what we want to be doing in social services, but I think it's probably true of, a, of, of many of our systems. I think what I wanted to kind of end with and, and sort of bring the conversation back to, to what we can talk about today is, you know, I, I don't think I need to... Uh, explain Maslow's hierarchy of need. It's been around for 50 years. It's a very well-known theory about how, you know, you need the basics before you can move on and self-actualize. Um, and over the years, many people, including myself, have used Maslow as a way to explain and justify housing first. And I think it makes a lot of sense, right? This idea that you need sort of the, the, the safety and control of an apartment before you can move on and tackle these other things. The only thing I'll say about that is I actually, in some ways, think that that does a disservice to the service delivery a little bit. 
uh, speaking as a parent of three, and my youngest is now eight months, you know, we, we are sort of inherently social beings that rely, you know, on our survival for people around us. And I think the, the risk of overemphasizing this is that we miss that how important it is to be connected to others. And I think when someone's homeless, uh, the dehumanization that happens, right, you can sort of, you're forced to kind of cut off some empathy from yourself and look past people, right? Because how could you stop all the time, all day long with 60,000 people on the streets? And, and so it's a disservice to them, it's a disservice to ourselves. Um, so, right, so I think, I, I, I guess the, you know, the idea of um, when we move people into housing, we hope that life gets better. And I think for a lot of people it does, but this need to be connected to their community is something we know through research and I think providers will tell you, we don't necessarily do a good job. And, and that's not something I don't think service providers can do, right? The formal supports really cannot replace the need for those informal supports and those connections. No, you know, we're just, as social workers, we're not around enough. You know, you, you don't spend enough time with people. You can't, you can develop those relationships, but it's gonna take the, it's gonna take the community, it's gonna take neighbors, it's gonna take communities that you build and having people feel a part of it. And I think, so the question in my mind is, how, how, can, how can all of you play a role, right? Remember, we have 14,000 people last year alone that moved in off the streets and into housing. A lot of them are alone and isolated. And as much as we reach out, we can't get to all of them. And so, you know, we, there's a lot of goodwill right now, and, and clearly people are passing measures to make a difference. But how can we make a difference actually connecting to one another? And so I think that, that's, my, that's my question for you all, right? And so, um, you know, clearly as a social worker, I can reach out and someone might say, you know, they want, they want, a, they want a community again. They want, they want to explore their religion, which is not something actually as social workers we're quite bad at kind of engaging in those conversations around spirituality, which uh, is something we need to work on. But, but for those people who do, you know, what do we do as providers and how can we connect with, with you all um, to, uh, to, to really to transform things in a different way. So I think that that's my question for you all, and I think uh, were you gonna have us discuss that or? Yeah. yeah, okay, well thank you for listening.